Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's Germination Retail Roundtable webinar. We're exploring the future of seed applied technologies today. My name is Mark Zinkwitz, and I serve as editor for Germination, and today I'm happy to be your host. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, 2020 Seed Labs, Cantera Seeds, and CCAN for their support. We'll be doing some live tweeting during the proceedings. I encourage you all to engage with us on Twitter if you're on Twitter by following the hashtag seed retail as we go along. During the presentations, you'll likely have some questions for our speakers. Please type these in the chat box at any time during the webinar and we'll address them during the Q&A sessions that we'll hold after each speaker finishes their presentation. Also, this webinar is being recorded and it will be made, it will be made available at germination.ca following the event. I'd like to introduce the first of our three speakers. Russell Trischuk is Regional Technical Manager for BASF Functional Crop Care in Saskatoon. In addition to his marketing role, Russell is also the BASF Canadian Plant Health Research Lead and is responsible for managing the research program and facility located at Innovation Place. He spent two years with BASF from 2006 to 2008, working in their research and commercial development group as well. Russell will speak today about BASF's approach to seed applied technologies and the path that it's taking as we move into the future. Russell, the floor is yours. Um, <clears throat> thanks for that, uh, that introduction, uh, Mark, and, and, and thank you again for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak here today on, on the webinar. Um, so in um, today's uh, uh, kind of my section of today's webinar, uh, what I'm going to cover off is, is I think give everybody some insight into what functional crop care is. That's a, a, an internal kind of uh, name that BASF has, has given. Uh, so give you some insight into kind of what I'm responsible for managing. And then uh, go through really kind of um, why BASF has cho chosen to uh, invest in the area of functional crop care and more specifically into on-seed technologies. Uh, we just have a uh, very uh, optimistic future for these technologies and, and have put uh, put uh, kind of our wallet where our, our mouth is in, in that context. Um, I thought I'd, I'd take you through uh, kind of some of the products that we're working on and, and kind of some of the things that you can expect um, to see coming out of our camp in the next, uh, you know, two to five years. And then also uh, kind of uh, talk a little bit about our product discovery pipeline. I know we've got some other uh, great uh, uh, guests with us today and, and really kind of wanted to uh, stress how important it was to uh, have individuals such as them working on these things because they really are an integral part of um, what we're trying to do and, and, and where these pro we see these products uh, going in the future. Um, so um, just a, a quick overview here. So as the, as the slide changes, um, as I said before, functional crop care is an internal, uh, you know, kind of name that, that BASF has given to this certain indication. And, and we kind of cover off three main areas within functional crop care. Uh, the first would be kind of uh, the soil management side. Uh, so looking at uh, nutrient management and, and kind of water use management in, in that context. Um, in addition to soil management, we're also kind of looking at what we refer to as crop care. And, and you can think of that in the context of really, um, you know, what are we able to provide as far as biostimulants, uh, enhancements, et cetera, in the, in the context of overall plant health and stress management and, and kind of looking at what we can do uh, in, in, in managing kind of all those other things outside of, of say, you know, disease control for, for existence. And then last but definitely not least, and, and I think this is probably makes up uh, a good, you know, 80 or 85 percent of the functional crop care portfolio is is our seed solution uh, uh, products, and that's really what I'm going to focus in on here today. Obviously, that's the the topic of of today's webinar. 
Uh, but I thought I'd kind of just give a quick introduction because a lot of people maybe don't understand, uh, you know, the functional crop care uh, label. So I thought I would just drive down into that. And I'll get into more detail as to kind of where we're looking in those areas as, as we get through some of the slides. So um, as I mentioned before, um, this is an area that BASF has, has very heavily invested in in, a, in the past uh, five to seven year window. Um, and, and the reason that, that they have chosen to do that is, is really um, they've identified this area in, 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 you know, specifically functional crop care, but even more uh, specific uh, seed solutions to, to be one of the major areas where we're going to see growth as, as we uh, strive on uh, into the future, as well as one of the major areas where we see, you know, kind of maybe it being the last frontier in agriculture and some, you know, one of the areas where we still think we can make significant change to how our, our customers and, and the growers around the world are producing uh, essentially the food that we, we want to eat uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, the slide that I have up right now is 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 pretty high level. Um, every three or four years, the, the the board of directors at BASF sits down and identifies kind of some of the critical areas that they want to focus our business in. And you can see um, agriculture is only a, a small portion of BASF's overall business. Um, I think about six to seven percent of our annual sales are contributed by the the ag agricultural sector of BASF. Um, so it isn't a, a major player, and you can see some of the other ones there that do generate more resources uh, back to BASF with regards to sale. And, and kind of the reason I put this slide up was to show that uh, as high up as the board of directors level, they've, they've decided that uh, in the agricultural business, both plant biotechnology as well as kind of functional crop care and our, and our seed solutions portfolios are the main areas where they're going to uh, put their investment dollars uh, in growth. And, and the reason I said that, you know, the, uh, the agricultural business really only, you know, brings in about 6 to 7% of BSS over pro overall profit was because um, contrary to that, um, we are the biggest consumers of their re research and development dollars. So even though we only contribute um, that, that smaller portion of income back to the organization, 25% uh, of BASF's uh, global R&D uh, budget, and I'm talking about all our business units, has actually been directed into, into our area. So it's a very exciting time for us uh, because of that, that heavy investment. Um, if you kind of want to break that down a bit more, that, that really equates to about $2 million a day globally that BASF invests into, into, the, uh, into agriculture with the, with the big focus being on the on-seed technologies. So the reason that they've invested uh, so heavily into this area is because, you know, through about a decade worth of analysis, um, they've kind of come to the conclusion that um, really for us to, to get to that next plateau of, of, of yields uh, to be able to, to feed, the, you know, our ever-growing population is that this is the one area where, where there's still a lot of development to, to be done. Um, it's, it's relatively diagrammatic here on the slide, but I think if you take a look at the corn plant on the left, you know, we've made some tremendous strides in, in yields in the past 30 to 40 years uh, uh, globally, um, you know, with the advent of, of, you know, effective herbicides and fungicides and insecticides, as well as a, a, a significant contrib contribution from, uh, you know, genetics. Um, but we're starting to, to see you know, the, the yield increase year over year just, just isn't what it used to be. So, I mean, we used to see, you know, tremendous, you know, five, six bushel uh, increases every year that a new variety came out. And as time has gone on, those increases that we're getting from either genetics or crop protection, they're, they're starting to be minimized. And, and it's our theory that we think that we've kind of reached a plateau for, for what those products are able to deliver. However, we still believe that there's a significant amount of yield still available for us to produce, uh, and those are, are, are being lost in areas that I, I think we're not maybe managing as, as good as we are in some other areas. And you can see kind of on the, the right-hand side, um, a lot of that has to do with the environment and, and abiotic stress and, and, and even some biotic stress that is, is really Im being imposed upon the plant. Um, you know, at a time when we don't really have a lot of crop protection products, if you think seed treatments, 
go on the seed and they have a certain uh, lifespan. And then we're not managing uh, that crop till a bit later on with other crop protection products. So they truly believe that by the use of kind of some of our on-seed technologies that we're going to be able to afford to plant, um, <clears throat> pardon me, um, a lot more uh, ability to, to manage stresses. So, you know, uh, whether it's drought or heat, um, a lot of the biological products that we bring out are, are, are you know, uh, addressing uh, nutrition and things like that. And we really believe that this is this, these products, the on-seed products and, and, and some of the ones that might go in the, the soil around the seed really will take us to the next level of, uh, of, of production in, uh, in our crops not only here in Western Canada, but, but, but globally, uh, whether it's, you know, you know, top end markets like we have here in Canada or even emerging markets like we have in some of the, the more uh, underdeveloped countries who are really just starting to uh, kind of modernize uh, their agricultural practices. Um, to, to be a bit more specific, um, you know, in the area of biologicals, which is an area where we've, we've put significant investment, is we believe that the use of biologicals in combination with, with traditional chemistries allows us to, uh, you know, kind of plug holes that we maybe the really current have uh, in, our, in our crop protection uh, systems uh, and, and ultimately, like I said, really improve the, uh, the output of the crops that we're putting it on. And, and a biological seed treatment uh, is, is an area where it's really easy to kind of demonstrate <clears throat> these benefits. So, if you look at a, a chemical seed treatment, um, it, it's put on the seed and it, it's a very effective mechanism for really managing those early season soil and seedborne diseases, as well as giving the plant a little bit of protection up until, you know, it's, it's able to, to get out of the ground and, and start producing for itself. However, we know that, you know, within a two or three week period after planting, uh, due to metabolization by the plant and the fact that that tiny seed has grown into quite a bit more biomass that the impact of, of that chemical seed treatment starts to wear off. And, and this is where we, we see the biological seed treatments come in and really have an impact. Um, even though you apply a biological seed treatment, and, and when I use that term, I'm referring to some sort of microorganism that we're also applying to the, the surface of the seed, um, it does take some time for that that uh, that microorganism to to grow and to colonize either the root system or the soil surrounding the root system, and for that reason, we do tend to see a little bit of a delayed response in in something such as disease control. However, um, you know this is is right in line with when we would you know when the biologicals start to provide disease control. It's right in line with when we would see maybe a chemical seed treatment starting to lose its efficacy. So we, we have seen this uh, being able to really bridge that gap of disease control up until later on in the season when we can put a, a foliar uh, fungicide on. And, and we've been able to measure um, surprisingly uh, impressive results from including a, a biological uh, seed treatment in, in our production practices. So just to kind of maybe drive that home a bit more, you know, in a specific area where we see some of these new on-sea technologies really starting to, to make their mark in, in agriculture. <clears throat> Specifically from a BASF perspective, one of the things that uh, is really exciting for me to be in, in this area and, and something that we've communicated out to our customers and, and to, the, to the industry and, and have kind of gotten some some shared excitement back is the fact that uh, we are the only company that currently has essentially um, a production uh, development pipeline for what we would consider to be all the major areas of on-seed technologies. So you can see from our my diagram on the on the screen right now, you know we have you know kind of some of the traditional things that you know I think everybody kind of maybe knows BSF for in the area of fungicides. Um, and with our recent acquisition of Becker Underwood, I guess uh, it's been about four or five years now, so it's not that recent anymore, but we brought in an entire suite of um, kind of biological inoculant and kind of functional coating type of products. And then more recently, you know, in the last uh, four to five years, we've also invested very heavily in, in our insecticide portfolio. So we now kind of come to the marketplace being able to offer all these different on-seed technology solutions. 
And really what our goal is, is to really try to synergize all of these products as best we can. And that's kind of symbolized by that one drop coming out of the funnel where all of these products are going into. Um, and we believe by having this entire suite of products at our disposal, not only are we going to be able to really understand what the needs of the on-seed technology world are, but hopefully we're going to be able to develop maybe some synergies between all of these products and ultimately deliver products where, you know, one plus one doesn't equal two, but maybe one plus one equals three because of, of some synergies we can gain. And I mean, the combination of chemical and biological seed treatments is, is, is an area where we would, um, you know, expect something like that. But also kind of in the area of functional coatings where we have additional additives that we're able to add with these different products that either improve their usability or maybe improve their environmental fate and, and things like that and really continue to, to drive the, the technology in this area uh, uh, forward. So um, to kind of just get into, you know, a little bit more specifics in, in areas that we're kind of focused on. So um, in the fungicide world, I mean, we've, we've been in the fungicide development game for a long time now. But one major change that happened uh, three years ago at our, our global screening facility is we actually now have a dedicated seed and soilborne pathogen screening program where all molecules are screened not only for their efficacy against major foliar diseases, but they're subsequently screened against all the major diseases that are impacting the seed, the seedling, and the soil. And this is a, in contrast to what we used to be where we would find an active ingredient that was a good fungicide. We would then develop it as a fungicide for, from the foliar perspective and then look to see if we actually had a fit on seed or, 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 or potentially in the soil. So that kind of change in philosophy has actually allowed us to identify a couple of molecules that we don't think would have passed the screening for a foliar fungicide, but have, have been found to be very effective, uh, you know, for on seed or in the soil. With regards to insecticides, as I mentioned earlier, we've just invested in a, in a very uh, high-tech screening system to, to screen insecticides, and, and you'll start to see in the future that BASF, maybe a company not necessarily known for their strength in insecticides, really start to come into this marketplace with, with some new... Uh, advancements in technology. Um, in the inoculant world, I mean, um, whether it's pea or lentil or soybean, I mean, uh, the use of a, a bacteria to, to supplement those crops for nitrogen production is probably our longest serving example of a, of a biological used in agriculture. And, and there's not a lot of new discoveries to be made in, in, in say, a new species or, or things like that. However, Due to the biological nature of them, um, we do spend a lot of time now trying to improve the formulations, improving on seed stability. Um, a problem in South America, for example, is, is storage. It's a hot environment down there. Uh, so we're working on really advancing the existing kind of rhizobial technologies we have and making them more user friendly, making better formulations uh, and such to, to just to continue to make these products easy to use for our customer. Um, in, in, in the biological arena, I think this is our biggest area. We really are looking at all sorts of different microorganisms, be it bacteria or fungi, uh, in, in two major areas. Um, one is in the biofungicidal uh, arena where we're looking for, uh, you know, the different bugs that are going to really help us manage uh, the existing diseases and any newly, uh, you know, newly emerging diseases that, that may start to pop up as we continue to push yields. And then the other side, kind of back to talking about that kind of plant health area, is we're also looking at a variety of different products, not only biologicals, but even byproducts of fermentation and, and biologicals uh, that are going to help those plants really just be healthier and, and more productive. And then lastly, like I said earlier, um, you know, we've got all these products that have specific um, kind of functions, whether it's disease control or nutrition. Uh, but there's also the challenge of, of keeping it on that seed. Um, you know, we know we can only get away with certain volumes on that seed. Um, you know, keeping the product there so it doesn't go into the environment. So alongside of all these technologies, we also have a whole array of, of what we refer to as functional coatings. They're going to help again with kind of that formulation and on seed use of, of these different products to make sure that they work as well as they can and, and they stay where they where we want them to. And then kind of in the last area that I alluded to is that, you know, 
it, it sounds like we've got a lot of stuff going on and, and we do. Uh, but a lot of what we have going on, we're not, we're not doing this alone. So, I mean, we obviously, you know, are, are, are pretty good at the, the fungicide development and screening process, uh, whether it's our own process or whether it's business to business relationships we've been able to develop over the years with other, uh, you know, companies that are providing chemistries. But when it comes to kind of the biological nature of a lot of these products, um, we really are, are relying on all the fantastic researchers at the different universities and governmental institutions and, and private research institutions to help us because there's just so many different bacterial species and so many different ecotypes of these uh, species that I mean, um, we're just fortunate that we have such a good research community that's able to identify these uh, work on them, and then ultimately come to us or, or, or vice versa, we go to them, and we're able to work with them and take these inventions and, and help them get them into the market and, uh, and to, to actually be products that a grower would use. And I mean, it doesn't just stop there. I mean, one of the, the real exciting things that I really like about my position is the fact that not only do I get to work with different universities to bring these technologies in, these relationships are ongoing. We have all sorts of collaborations and we support all sorts of grants because we also uh, uh, pride ourselves, and I'm, I'm referring to us at BSF, in, in not only providing these, these solutions to our customers, but also being able to explain to them what their value is, how they work, you know, what are they actually doing when they interact with the plant. And I mean, that's where a lot of these collaborations really uh, provide the biggest benefit is the education that we're getting back from the different research institutions, which allows us to then go out and, and provide our customers with all the information that they need to make educated decisions on what products are going to best, uh, you know, impact their, not only their production, but, but ultimately their bottom line. So um, again, just a, a quick overview, and like I said, I'm, I'm really excited about what I get to do and what I get to work with, and I could, could talk for this uh, for hours, but I mean with uh, you know, only 15 minutes, um, that's where I'll cut it off, and uh, we'll pass it off to the next speaker, and I'll be here to answer any questions that would come up uh, moving forward. Thank you so much, Russell. We'll now have a short Q&A session. If you have a question for Russell, please type it into the chat box now. Russell, how can retailers ensure they're up on the latest seed applied technologies in order to properly inform and educate their customers? Um, at BASF, and, and this is uh, you know a little bit specific to Canada because that's where I'm located. But we, uh, on an annual basis, have um, you know as a as an organization in the range of probably about five to six hundred different commercial trials uh, across Western Canada, where we have you know these products which are you know kind of two years out and 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 closer in the field uh, through different uh, trial programs. So I mean. Um, we have them out there with the specific design that retailers and customers can come and, and, and talk to us and take a look at these products before they come out. So we, we do have these trials, um, you know, in the field. And I would just say contact any of your, anybody you know from BASF, whether it would be sales reps or business reps or even our, our tech team or even our marketing team. And we'd be able to not only tell you where these trials are, but likely we'd be able to have someone come out there and, and walk the fields with you and really kind of show you what we're working on and, and what we're developing. I have a question, Russell, in regards to um, pollinators. I always hear controversy about seed treatments and pollinators. In fact, the EU just imposed further restrictions on the use of neonics. Where are things at right now with regard to these regulations in Canada, and where do you see things going in the future in that regard? Um, so in Canada, we, we too have started to have, you know, some stricter regulation on the, on the neonicotinoids. Um, in, in Eastern Canada, so uh, Ontario uh, in, in particular, they've taken um, a, a pretty, um, I would say, firm stance on, on the use of neonics. Uh, they've, they've essentially imposed some legislation now that requires um, a customer who has a, a need to, to manage an insect pest with a neonic, uh, you know, go through a series of, of uh, field scouts and, and paperwork 
really to to justify to the to the regulators that there is a need for for the neonics. Um, so I mean that's something that you know is, has really hit close to home here in Canada, similar to the EU, where they they essentially have toll growers. You know you 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 have to go through these hoops to be able to to show us that you need these products. Um, so I mean as a result of that that legislation, I mean the the eyes definitely are are focused on on these products and with. Um, you know, I think some new news about, you know, finding them in places where um, maybe we didn't necessarily think they were going environmentally, that uh, I think the, the scrutiny on, on neonics in particular is probably going to continue. Um, I mean, they're a very large portion of what we uh, use in, in Western Canada to grow canola. So I think there is some nervousness in the industry that, uh, you know, uh, someday um, potentially similar regulations might move to Western Canada. I think the, the thing with Western Canada is I don't know if there would be any canola grower that would be hard pressed to prove to the regulators that they needed this product because, you know, we all see how devastating wireworms can be even when we have, say, a neonic on, on a canola seed. But I would say that there is definitely increased scrutiny and increased uh, uh, pressure on the neonics, um, not only in, in, you know, globally, but also here in Canada. Uh, the fortunate news, though, is that, I mean, we have <clears throat> by far the best regulatory bodies uh, here in Canada. The PMRA and the CFIA are really uh, second to none globally. And we know that they, you know, do value scientific uh, uh, information and things like that. And I know that, uh, you know, the industry uh, has been working closely with them and is keeping them abreast of everything that's going on. Um, so even though there is, uh, you know, like I said, increased pressure and scrutiny. I do think we're in a good situation with the PMRA just because of how good of a regulator they are uh, to hopefully manage these uh, these uh, products as, as effectively because I do feel that they uh, do play a major role in what we're able to accomplish and, and they do have a need. We're just going to have to make sure that we, we take things into consideration to make sure we're using them as responsibly as we can. It seems biologicals are less likely than chemicals to show a consistent benefit. What should farmers keep in mind when comparing biological and chemical solutions, especially with regard to consistency of performance and expectation of results? That's a, that's a good question. And I think the one word that popped out for me is, is the word expectation. So that's where I spend a lot of my uh, time is really trying to understand how the products are working so that we can, ex, you know, set appropriate expectations. And I mean, um, <clears throat> the consistency of these products working is, is, is definitely a reality. Um, that is a bit of uh, due to... <clears throat> the nature of how some of these products are regulated. Uh, certain products um, that are regulated under the, um, the Fertility Act or the Fertilizer Act um, no, don't have a, uh, a, um, a requirement to submit efficacy data in order to receive registration. So if it is, if it is something that's kind of registered by the CFIA, um, you know, just having an understanding of the fact that certain companies may not have had to provide efficacy data to show their their value would would you know kind of give everybody insight into the fact that you know certain products um, it is a bit buyer beware. Um, what I would say is that uh, you know for certain suites of products, make sure that you ask a lot of questions about the products. Um, if they've only got an N of one, I mean that's only one trial. You know how credible is is that that data? Um, we're, what we're trying to do at BSF with products in this area, we're trying to give a lot of information as to how they're working, what the grower can expect, so that when they go out there to measure it, um, you know, they, they know what they're, they're looking for. Um, so, I mean, that would be kind of my biggest advice, and it is when I give presentations, is ask questions. Um, if you want to see, if you want to know how something works, ask for data. If they don't have data, uh, chances are they, they might not have data for a reason, um, and, and just really, like I said, make sure you understand how the products work, because when it comes to something like uh, a biological fungicide, you know, um, a grower may not know that its activity is actually maybe three to five weeks after the crop comes up, not one to two like a traditional seed treatment. So, 
educate yourselves as to what the products are doing, ask lots of questions, ask the companies who are selling them for that support data, uh, and then again, um, you know, understand what where the regulators are on, on certain products because there are some that are, like I said, less scrutinized, and those are the ones where you have maybe a higher potential for uh, inconsistency as a result of them not requiring any data to, to get that uh, type of claim. Do you provide recommendations to retailers showing under which conditions or fields biologicals work best? You know, we really are trying to go that route. So, I mean, certain biologicals under, you know, what we would consider to be ideal conditions, which I know is a bit of a loose term because I would say that there's never really an ideal condition, especially in Western Canada. There are some situations where under ideal conditions, if you have, a, say, a biostimulant that you've put on seed that's going to help with uh, stress management, um, if stresses are minimized, then you're probably not going to see the response. Likewise, on the other side of that coin, if you have a very, you know, stressful year like we had had last year where there was, you know, a reduction in moisture in significant areas, we were able to say, you know what, this product is going to shine. So, so at BASF, we really are trying to do that. We're trying to, you know, give everybody as much information as possible so that they know when and when not to, to maybe make recommendations you know, when they, when a grower may, you know, maybe something like this is positioned a little bit more like a, a, an insurance policy at a, at a few dollars an acre. And it may not pay off every year, but in the year that uh, there's a stress, it may pay for, for four years type of thing. So we really do try to understand that so we can give those best recommendations. And I mean, it's a process. We're just getting into this. And every year we know more and, and communicate more out. Uh, but that really is our end goal, is to be kind of the lead organization for that type of information on these types of products. Well, thank you so much, Russell. I'd like to now introduce our second speaker of the day. Alan Taylor is Professor of Seed Science and Technology at Cornell University in New York. The emphasis of Alan's research is on post-harvest aspects, including seed treatments and coding technologies. Projects range from applied seed technology to more fundamental aspects of seed biology on vegetable crop, hemp, agronomic crop, and bio biofuel crop seeds. Alan will speak about some exciting new research in the area of seed applied technologies and give us a snapshot of what this research means for the industry in the years ahead. Take it away, Alan. Well, Mark, thank you for the, the introduction. And uh, I'm really pleased to be one of the, the speakers on the program for you uh, for this afternoon. I think R Russell did a really nice job of kind of looking kind of in a broad sense of agriculture, some of the issues where there can be various biotic or abiotic stresses occurring early on that could affect the germination stand establishment aspects. So I want to kind of take off on that particular uh, area of what else we can do with our seed treatment and seed coating technology. So I think we can go right into the, the presentation with the next slide. And again, we've already talked about this. And, and most of us, when we say the word seed treatments, we normally think of pest management, insecticide, fungicide, these type of treatments and uh, they're you know it's 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 a very very large industry with you know several major uh, egg companies uh, BASF being one of those uh, involved in this and a very very important tools for the for the farmers so we're really kind of exploiting the whole area that seeds are the delivery system and besides the pest management my question is, is, what else can we do to can, can continue using that seeds as a delivery system? Next. So at the university level where I'm at, I'm, I, I'm at a, the Cornell New York State Ag Experiment Station. So we're the land grant university in upstate New York. Um, everything we do is pretty much on a small laboratory scale. So this is a rotary pan technology that, that we use. It's, uh, it's called the R6 for being six inches or 15 centimeters across. 
But the, basically the principles that are used in this, where the seeds would be spinning at the bottom and then you have this atomization disk are very common even for the larger commercial units. But what you have is uh, seeds and the whole purpose with the coating is to have seeds being treated uniformly and uniformly over the seed surface. Also, we want to try to avoid any agglomeration, any of what we call doubles from occurring where we're using some of the materials which can cause uh, the seeds to kind of glue to each other. So by the seeds being able to spin in this system, we can apply materials, uh, both liquids as well as powdered materials and to develop a seed coating. Uh, we actually have a, a little YouTube. Uh, it hasn't gone viral yet, but uh, but we've had a number of hits on that over over the years of kind of looking at this type of a small scale technology. And much of what we do are in small seeded vegetables and other crops that uh, that you'll see. So so this is really handy for the type of work that we do. Okay, next. So I want to really talk about two different topics with you. Again, kind of using the seed as the delivery system platform. The first are biostimulants. Uh, Russell mentioned this. And here we're looking at really a, a kind of a broad class of compounds that can be microorganism, other, other constituents that are enhancing some aspect either the germination or the early seedling growth. These can fall into various categories, microbial inoculants, uh, humic acid, fulvic acid, uh, protein, amino acid, hydrolysates, and seaweed extracts. Uh, what we're going to talk about is, again, an example from my own laboratory, but just realize that this is not restricted when we talk about our work, it, that we're looking at a number of different uh, materials that can serve as biostimulants. And it's a fairly active uh, research area, both in the academic world, uh, as well as in, in industry on the biostimulants. And again, a lot of it that you'll see, uh, my colleagues in academia are looking at foliar applications, things like that. So it's, this isn't just restricted as a seed treatment, but my particular area in seed treatment and technologies, we're really focusing these uh, as part of the coating material. Okay, next. So we're, we're going to be looking at a, a couple of different vegetable crops that uh, we, we work with, broccoli and tomato and a seed coating system. Um, Masi is a postdoc in my laboratory. And then our, uh, another person is Dr. Natravalli. Uh, he's a professor in natural materials on our main campus uh, in Ithaca. So uh, through some of the work that he has done looking at different materials, he kind of said, is, well, do you think you can use some of these materials as, as seed coatings? And I said, well, yeah, we can always, we can look at those, even though we're kind of had some of our own materials that we use. Uh, we, so we, we've kind of started this project with him a few years ago. Basically what we're going to be focusing on is the soy flour is serving as two different functions. The soy flour we're going to see is really is the biostimulant, looking at the proteins that are present there. The diatomaceous earth, you might know it as DE, is kind of as the inert filler. Also the soy flour is that be, is when it becomes wet during the coating process, when it dries, it also acts as the binder. So we would call the soy flour as, as a dry binder, basically. So the only thing we have to do during the coating process is we're really just spraying water onto the seeds and letting the dry coating mix actually do everything to form the coating. When you see these numbers, 30, uh, 70, 40, 60, basically we're looking at the ratios of these different materials that we've, we've mixed together. Uh, in the case of these small seeded vegetables, we're looking at kind of an encrustment with a 30% weight increase. It's not a full size pellet. You can still see the, uh, the size and the shape of the seed quite readily, but it is, is a buildup. So there's a uniformity of deposition of the coating material around the seed surface. Okay, next. So one of the things that we're concerned about anytime when we're developing in a seed coating is we want the coating to have good mechanical integrity, but then after it's planted into a moist soil, then it's gonna kind of break away. So, so 
So we don't want the coatings to break up into the planter where there'd be any dust off problems, things like that. So that's where we need the, the good dry mechanical strength. But again, we want the coatings to, like I said, is not to provide a physical barrier for germination or some of the materials to actually encapsulate around the seed and affect gas diffusion, which would, uh, if we retired respiration, we can negatively impact the germination. So some of our coatings, we just have coated the seed. You see that small amount built. We're, we're actually, the seeds are in water here. You can see like the little bubbles there. We're looking down into a small uh, little plastic container. And then after just a few hours, they take up water and they start to fracture away. So basically the coatings are kind of not being a barrier. So they're not going to harm the germination process. And, it, and this is really important as you're putting more and more materials onto the seeds that you don't have a deleterious effect from the uh, coatings around the seed. Okay, next. Well, really what I wanna emphasize in much of this work we've done in the laboratory as a screening, as you would like in a germination testing, uh, also in greenhouse work that we've done. So using the tomatoes, we have the controls and non-coated seeds, and then we have these different uh, proportions with the soya flour. So the, basically where we're seeing the biostimulant is we're seeing that largely in the shoot growth and that we're getting increased shoot growth where you see SD shoot stands for the standard deviation. So basically what you want is longer, you know, faster growth, but you want the seedlings to be more uniform. So the smaller the number is, the less the standard deviation, which means the more uniform. You can see, look at the controls there on the, on the left. You see a lot of small seedlings, which a seed analyst could call those as abnormal seedlings in a germination test. That same seed lot, after we coat that, we're not seeing those really short runty. It's kind of, it has extended uh, their growth potential. We also, in some cases, see, see enhanced uh, root growth with this, this as well. So this is our tomato work, next. And just, I don't want to spend a lot of time on data, but just again, it was the early events, GMAX just stands for the percent germination, the maximum percent germination, which we record, we're taking counts on a daily basis. So we're seeing no, no differences there. GU stands for the germination uniformity. So we're taking counts every 24 hours. Then we don't, you want the seeds to germinate as uniformly as possible. The T50 is the, the rate of germination. How long does it take for 50% of the seeds to germinate? So in some of the earlier coatings that we were making, and we published a paper on this uh, in, in 2016, we actually had some negative impacts on germination and uniformity. So, so we're trying to improve to overcome some of those. But now you look at the, the, the shoot growth, root growth, and now we're seeing the, the nice increases there in that growth, the root growth uh, potential and the shoot growth. The SBI just combines this, the seedling bigger index combines both the germination and the, the seedling growth. So we're basically seeing under kind of this laboratory situation, basically like it's in a standard germination type of a testing, we're seeing this enhancement of the early seedling growth. All the same variety, all the same seed lot of tomato. Okay, next. We're basically just gonna have the same story repeated again here. So this isn't just something fluky that this tomato coating happens to be good, but it doesn't work on anything else. Uh, we're also using uh, broccoli, the same basic story we're seeing with the promotion. And we've looked at different vegetable crops as well and trying to, to develop the system beyond this. And we're generally seeing this, this biostimulant effect, this uh, enhanced seedling growth uh, is, is really translating over to a, a number of different systems. Okay, next slide. And again, I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the data, but just again, the GMAX, the germination uniform of the T50, no differences. So we're not, this is not a seed priming effect where the seeds are going to germinate faster, but we're not having any deleterious effect. And that's really what we want from a coating. We don't want it to slow down germination. We don't want it to reduce the percentage of germination. But again, we're seeing the improvement uh, largely here in, in the shoot growth of this uh, with, the, with the broccoli system. Okay. 
So we've even taken this uh, to, to the greenhouse and looking at taking plants and growing those in containerized systems where we can, we actually look at this. We've also looked at nitrogen uptake. Uh, the pro, uh, excuse me, the, the soy flour contains proteins. The proteins is also a source of nitrogen. So you'd say, well, maybe if you're increasing the nitrogen uptake by the plants, maybe it is simply that the soy flour is acting as a source of fertilizer of nitrogen fertilizer. But after we do the calculations, the contribution from the protein content, the nitrogen portion of the soy flour is a very, very small percentage. So we're actually looking at the enhanced uptake and things like that uh, from the soy flour coating as the biostimulant. Okay, next. So now we're gonna change gears into another aspect. Again, still taking advantage of that seed coating that you're gonna be putting on a seed and using the seed as a delivery system. Now we're doing some work with cover crops. And in our situation with cover crops, which will be very similar uh, to you, we're in this northern latitude. We have a relatively short growing season. Let's say if the farmer is growing corn, but we want to establish a cover crop, we don't want to wait to the end of the season. It's really too late. So we want to have like an interseeding. So basically the corn is planted in, in May. And then when the corn would be side dressed, then we'd want to go ahead and place the cover crop seeds or later. So we're developing these coatings. We used red clover. We also used the ryegrass. I think we've just been showing the red clover data here. Where here we're adding a hydrophilic material in the coating material. So basically as we're getting out into June, July, it can be very dry. The soils can be very dry at that time. So what we want to do is have the hydrophilic component of the seed coating absorb moisture at the time of the planting and hold that moisture around the seed. And then as if the soil starts to dry down further, that moisture is held around and for the seed to get established. So we're looking at kind of that ecological niche there to help the germination of the seed under basically under these uh, droughty situations. Next slide, please. So we're looking at some of these coating materials. Uh, we, this project was in collaboration with a company in Idaho called Summit. And they had this material called Hydrolock, which is their hydrophilic material. This is work that we did last year. And basically you can see the coatings after we're putting them on a moist condition, you can see the swelling of some of the coatings and that they germinate fairly quickly too as this, it takes up the water and holds it around the seed. And that's really what we're looking for uh, here is that the water absorption. I just want to make a mention uh, on just how these polymers are working. So there must be free moisture there in the soil. It's It's got to have free water to be able to take up and then it'll hold that even though the soil starts to dry. If you plant these coated seeds in dry soil, they're not going to suck up moisture out of a dry soil. It doesn't work that way. They're hydrophilic. They're not hydroscopic. So you have to have the right conditions up front at time of sowing, and you're going to know that. But what you're, you're really the insurance is, is if that soil can dry, especially if you'd be planting these in the summertime where the soil could dry very rapidly, the seed would not have a chance to get germinated and established. That's really what we're relying on the coatings for. Okay, the next slide. Uh, for doing some, besides doing some field work, uh, we developed this kind of as this laboratory, excuse me, this greenhouse type of a screening. We're using this uh, turfus material, which is a, a calcium type of a, of a clay material. It has a high water holding capacity, but also dries very rapidly. So we've established this here in this plastic container, which has a lid on it too, that right now the lid is off. You can see the different coatings uh, that are planted on here in the middle is the non-treated check. So here the moisture is, is ample at the time of the planting. Next. And the, so what we've kind of worked out is that initially the, the moisture content, again, this is a very, uh, it absorbs a lot of water, 90%. But then as these containers, as things are just drying in the greenhouse, 
after about two days, now we're down to a lower soil moisture content, which is starting to create a drought situation. Again, this is a screening technique. This isn't the field situation, but it's a screening technique where we can actually plant them on a media and then we can kind of control the moisture content just by putting the lid on so we prevent any additional evaporation. Okay, next. <clears throat> so looking after four days, we see the non-treated check just starting to germinate with very poor germination. The coatings, and I did not go through that, but the four to one just stands for a four to one uh, coating ratio. So a one to one is just one part of weight of the seed to one part of the coating. So we're kind of working with some of these different variables uh, in the establishment uh, of this and, and doing some of this screening work. But definitely we can see all, in this case, all the coated seeds doing much better in the establishment phase under this simulated drought situation in the greenhouse. Okay. So I think, you know, as I, I know I moved fairly quickly through this, but I, I wanna present that you know, the, the seeds can really be besides the pest management, which is definitely key. You know, we've, we've spent years and years working with entomologists, plant pathologists, other people in the pest management. So I don't want to say that that is not important. It's just that this is another value added aspect. While you have the seeds, while you're going to be doing the coatings, that you're also adding to the functionality of the coatings. Here we see kind of the cosmetic aspect in film coating with the bean seeds, we have that. But beyond the cosmetic, we're really interested in the functional aspects of what else that we can do with the coating. So thank you for uh, your, your attention on, on this segment of the presentation. Thank you so much, Alan. We'll now have another brief Q&A session. If you have a question for Alan, please type it into the chat box now. Alan, what advantages do biostimulants have over traditional chemistry or any possible disadvantages? Well, Mark, that's a really good question. So I think, first of all, you have to look at kind of the mode of action. So we're, we're, these are not doing anything with pesticidal control. So they're not competing and things like that. They're not doing the same thing as a fungicide or an insecticide. We're really looking at at these materials, these natural materials, uh, in this case, like I said, the soy flour, that is acting as a biostimulant. So we're actually altering the, really the physiology of the seed to see that. The seeds are not germinating faster. So it's not that they germinate faster, therefore they're, they're ahead of the rest. It's actually the growth phase itself in the early part of the growth phase uh, that uh, we're seeing this promotional aspect. So, so really it, it would kind of complement I would say uh, the pest management type of seed treatments. At this point, the only the disadvantages that we saw was early on, where we could we were actually measuring a reduction in the percent germination and a slow. The coating was actually acting as a barrier, being a little bit detrimental. And I think through some of the continued work uh, that we've done, we've kind of overcome some of those problems. So we, like I said, we we do not want to set the the seeds back at the very beginning by slowing down their germination. We really want to just have a promotional environment to really allow these materials to work. And do you see products like this replacing traditional chemistry in the retail market at any point in the future? Probably the materials uh, that would be somewhat, somewhat competitive to this would be plant growth regulators, the PGRs, might have a, a particular mode of action. Uh, and that, but with the PGRs, then you have all the, the regulatory aspects and things like that of, of putting materials on seeds. Here we're looking at all natural materials. So, so we get around much of that, that regulatory aspect uh, by using these type of materials in the coating. So it's, it's a much much easier to implement on a commercial scale, even at a small scale, there's not a lot of cost uh, because of, we don't have, I guess, some of these regulatory barriers. Well, thank you so much, Alan. Moving on now to our third and final speaker of the day, 
John Kibbe operates Kibbe ST Consulting out of Guelph, Ontario. He has a history of product development and technical management experience in seed treatments with an extensive background in global crop protection formulations with deep knowledge of seed treatment technology and market needs. John's experience includes application, regulatory, efficacy, product launch, and commercial support. He's going to talk a bit about challenges and opportunities surrounding microbes for seed treatment. You're up, John. Yeah, thank you, Mark, and, and thanks, uh, Russell and Alan, for, for a couple of really interesting presentations. I'm glad I could just uh, be here to sit through those. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. So. I'll be covering the use of microbes and seed treatment in a very general way. Uh, I've been working on these for several years, and I, I found that they can do some incredible things, and we've really, I, I know that we've only just scratched the surface on what we can do with these. I, I do want this presentation just to give you a sense of uh, what's required to create a commercial product and to uh, appreciate the level of testing that's needed, and also to give you an idea on the scope and range of uh, things that we can work with and what they can do. There's really a, a great deal of research and development going into uh, uh, microbes and, and biological in, in general, and absolutely there's some good questions like how consistent are they versus chemistry. Certainly that's, that's one of the answers and, and one of the um, specific things that research is uh, dedicated to making them more consistent, finding the organisms that are more consistent for performance, and uh, you'll see continuous improvement in that. Anyway, the, um, so my background, I've been in uh, chemistry, seed treatment uh, formulations, and if you look, look at this picture uh, on the top right, this is uh, kind of our view of ourselves early in my career. We're uh, working for the department for the, the development of dangerous chemicals, and certainly in comparison to what we're doing now, um, it, it was a whole lot different. We made enormous improvement over the last decade. And really, uh, it has become, uh, seed treatments has become a, a very low impact crop protection method. Um, but there's still always uh, room for improvement. So the next evolution is microbe as a core technology. Everybody thinks, okay, we'll use microbes, they're green, they have a much better uh, consumer image, much better consumer accept, uh, acceptance. Uh, we do know that they're much more complicated and challenging to formulate and make into products that work well in the seed treatment process, works well in the field, works consistently in the field. But, you know, regardless of the image part of it, there is potential for doing a lot more with the biologicals than uh, we, we can with chemistry. And they really uh, augment each other, such as in Russell's uh, presentation, I, I'm a strong believer in that, that uh, the, the chemistry is great for the early season protection, followed by longer duration performance from the microbes. So how did nice microbes in the seed environment get started? Well, nature started it. We just copied it, like, like a lot of things. Um, it took me a long time to adjust my thinking. I, I, I spent a lot of my career with fungicides and seeds and, and trying to protect against these horrible disease organisms. And now, you know, I, I need to change my concept of it and, and think about nurturing them and, and uh, uh, allowing them to survive. So. As far as nature goes, rhizobia is the obvious one uh, for uh, nitrogen fixation on le legumes, and certainly man has helped that by having microbe inoculation on, on seeds like that. But there are many other subtle relationships that exist uh, in the environment. We're learning more about them every day, and there's always been uh, microbes being associated with plants, uh, whether it's in agricultural or, or just in nature, and we, we just want to learn to harness that power. So one of the first things we did in the uh, seed treatment world with microbes was to uh, develop seed treatment fungicides. That was the first extension, and the one that's very well known. But there, there's a wide variety of things that we can do with them. There's, uh, they can be used as biostimulants, uh, lot, lots of opportunities for that, lots, lots of good examples already on that. You can do a lot for abiotic stress management. There's a wide variety of fungicidal microbes now. Uh, Kodiak was one of the first ones, one of the first microbe treatments, and, and I was around when we were doing that. And it, 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 that was, uh, it's really evolved from that kind of approach. We were taking a few 
uh, microbes from some researchers who found some interesting properties with them, screening a few, finding some activity, making products that did some good, but absolutely weren't as consistent as, as they might be. That's changed a lot. There's a lot of work going on with nitrogen fixation for non-legumes to help uh, reduce um, application of nitrogen fertilizers. There's uh, azospirillum have, have been used in, uh, they're, they're quite popular in Latin America for uh, nitrogen fixing on, on cereals. There's a lot of other companies, Pivot Bio and others are doing a lot of foundational work on new generations of nitrogen fixation for non-legumes. And that'll be, a, that'll be a big addition to the portfolio and, and, and a big environmental improvement by being able to reduce nitrogen applications and cost savings as well, of course. I think nematicide use of uh, microbes has probably got the biggest attention, such as Bayer's Elevo and Syngenta's Clariva, and uh, we, we continue to see more products put on the market for that purpose, and, and I'm sure they'll evolve and get better. There's also an interesting category of multifunctional microbes, and, and this is like, you know, well-established. This is not just smoke and mirrors. These, these are well-established scientifically. Uh, FMC's uh, nemics. If you look at labels from around the world, they'll have uh, biostimulant claims. There's nematicidal claims. There's fungicidal claims. So multi multifunctional performance. That's that's really exciting, and it, it, it's really interesting to learn the science of why they can do that and how they can do that. So I I, I spoke to the potential performance advantages. Absolutely, I'm a big believer that it. Uh, extends and enhances the uh, control of uh, chemical seed treatments. So it, it takes it from the first uh, couple of weeks and, and beyond where uh, the, the chemistry starts losing their effectiveness. They also have a choice of being very targeted or very, very broad. So if you're looking for general plant health and, and trying to get a broad range of uh, performance against fungi, you can do that. But if you have a particular disease, they can also be targeted to a particular disease. So that's, that's fascinating in terms of, you know, the types of products you can make from that and, and what the, it can be, you know, re really precision type of applications. Uh, I, I do, uh, I am fascinated. What can they do that chemistry can't? Nitrogen fixation is, is the obvious one, but we'll learn more about uh, what other things we can do with chemistry that is too complicated, or with, with biologicals, it's just too complicated to do with a chemistry. One thing that often gets overlooked is these microbes, they're really a new mode of action. So when you use that for as a fungicide, it's a new mode of action to help resistance management. It's, uh, it, it, it's an ever never ending battle of fighting diseases and the resistance that develops in that. And this, this is really gonna help with that. And I'm, I'm convinced that there's many many advantages that will, as we do more research, we'll find more things that they can do to, to help agriculture. So on the microbe range, there's uh, basically two types of, two categories of bacteria that I, I'll talk about, and that's gram positive and gram negative. There's a lot, to, there, there's a few uh, really good fungi products on the market as well. So that they're the basic categories. There are other types, uh, but these are the major ones of interest right now. And there's also the concept of using combinations versus individual species. And, and, and that's in itself, if you start thinking about the possibility of adding two or three or four different microbes on one seed that work together to perform functions, a function very well or multiple functions, that, that uh, just creates uh, a lot of interesting possibilities. So I thought I should speak to gram positive versus gram negative. Gram positive are these spore forming bacteria. They get this very hardy, durable state. They're, they're made as a mechanism for bacteria be, to be able to survive in difficult environments. So they're very robust. They're easier to formulate. They are the most uh, common type that have been commercialized to date, but they're not the only ones. There, there are gram negatives. They don't have a spore form. And because of that, they don't have this protected state. They are really difficult to work with for uh, trying to keep them alive in formulations, trying to keep them alive in seed. So why wouldn't you just say, well, forget them, they're too weak? Well, there is a lot of genetic diversity in those. There's a lot of uh, different functionality and 
rhizobia are not spore formers, and, and that's enough of a reason to, to just give you an idea of why nature has just this variety of uh, types of microbes. So they do require a lot more formulation work to make them work. So in, a, in the development of a, a microbiological product, the, the first step is strain selection. There's a lot of different strategies. A lot of different companies have some just want to do massive um, random selection of microbes from the environment. Some have other more targeted ones. They look for certain fuel conditions. They look for certain environments and try to get organisms out of that. But there's always some sort of uh, sampling program needed to generate the leads as to what's going to work well. Um, part of the process is always agronomic performance screening. Back in the old days, that's pretty much what it was. But there's been a lot of knowledge and, and uh, opportunities and, and methods for really using science to do a lot better job of finding the right microbes. Things like just our knowledge of the, the genomes, being able to do computational modeling of the microbes. And uh, one thing I've, I've discovered can really lead to good, uh, good leads is uh, understanding the microbe, the microbes' metabolism, what they're producing, how they interact with each other, how they interact with the plant, and that can lead to a lot of really interesting insight into what microbes to pick. And then once you have these good strains, there's also a lot of techniques such as new breeding techniques that will allow you to, uh, similar to plant breeding, be able to breed these microbes into uh, a higher performing version of the one found in the natural environment. Regardless of all that brilliant science, there's still a lot of trial and error testing done on uh, lab scale or field scale uh, agronomic performance development trials. So the basic steps of the screening stage is you identify the candidate, you assess for allen seed survival. This is a seed treatment. I think that's an important thing that some people forget about. You want to put this on seed, they better be able to survive in seed. You can help them survive, but if they're really weak, they're probably not a good candidate. Assess seed safety, make sure they don't have negative impacts on that. And then again, assess an agronomic screening uh, in some sort of rudimentary seed treatment formulation. And from that, you can, uh, you know, this could be small plot or lab scale, and you can select uh, some good lead candidates to carry forward into next stages of development. So the second stage, there's always the second stage of invention, and uh, there's some unique things required for microbes. One of them is making sure you look at your fermentation process. Changing your fermentation process can really help make the uh, microbes more robust, more robust, more robust in the soil, more robust in the, on the seed, and so that's part of it. That's a special part. You, you select your formulation approach and. The formulation approach for microbes is really a, quite a novel and, and recent development, that, uh, especially when you get away from gram-positive bacteria. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot of different methods for making it work. Putting it into a powder is an easier way to do it, but obviously uh, people want to apply liquids for seed treatments. Um, there's technologies available. There's protectants that you can add for it. You can encapsulate the bacteria kind of making your own uh, spore form them. Um, but all these solutions are pretty strain specific. So it's not like you have a general solution that you can plug all your microbes in. You have to really do a lot of work to make sure what, find out what works best for the one, the organisms you're interested in. Again, Pivot Bio, they're doing work with gram negatives and they're, they're doing, they're really doing a lot of leadership in the development of this and investing a lot of money to be able to create that into a, a common practice in uh, commercial application. You also have to look at, okay, these are seed treatments. You need to understand the technology of the application. You need to understand all the ins and outs of the treating processes that you're going to subject these microbes to. Ideally, and really ideally, you really want to fit into the existing seed treatment practices, unless you have something, a major step change. Uh, the, uh, there is a lot of reluctance to change things just for another application. Um, second stage, these are just other uh, 
longer term, uh, wider reaching, expanding it just to test it across environment, to test it uh, on a lot of different situations. It, it, we recognize that making sure that we have consistency of performance across geographies, across environment, across climate is a very important aspect that it, uh, a lot of the biologicals have been weak in performance in that respect. So it's pretty elaborate. And of course, because it's a seed treatment process, and I put this in here because I'm a I'm a big believer in the uh, seed treatment stewardship guide. Um, CSTA's uh, link is provided in this presentation. It's uh, it tells you the things you need to do for a good seed treatment, uh, looking at things like treatment uniformity, equipment buildup, uh, bridging. Certainly, seed dust is really important. Everybody recognizes that as a key performance criteria now. Looking at seed flow, looking at platability. The seed treatment guide gives you a good checklist of things you need to uh, look for to make sure that it'll, it'll work in the commercial facilities, but you do need expertise to make sure that that's tested properly and good decisions are made. And then, uh, of course, the uh, third stage is common to pretty well all product development, crop protection development, or any, even other types of, you gotta scale up somewhere. Um, there's some Particular challenges here with uh, fermentation scale up, that can be a challenge, and treating scale up. These, these formulations are quite different than um, traditional chemical seed treatments, so you really need to be careful that they will perform as expected in, in uh, large scale treating plants. So my predictions for the futures, uh, they're going to get, microbes will get better and better. I, I, I see the science going into it. I see the uh, the, the processes where they're, they're enhancing the performance of the microbes that are already in the environment. Um, I, I see that the amount of trials being done to verify their performance and select them for the best performance. And through all that, we're going to see some big step changes where there's going to be uh, microbes that really compete in a lot of very strongly versus a lot of other options in the not too distant future. Formulation technology relating to microbes is going to revolve, evolve rapidly again. It's just uh, in the last five years that it's really picked up and it, it takes time, but uh, with that much effort going into it, you're going to see some really great improvements in the uh, microbe uh, uh, formulation performance. We also have to think about how will the treating process has evolved. Yeah, we want to fit in, but as we get more and more microbe um, formulation or microbe treatment operate, uh, options available, the big uh, commercial creators will start thinking more about, okay, how should my process be to make these work best for us? There's also the other side of the coin. There's a lot of simplicity to just uh, apply right before planting on farm or even in furrow as a, a route to get into the seed. And I, I think uh, there will be a, uh, some of that picked up because of the results of the benefits you can get from these microbes. I think every major player and pretty well even minor players will have several microbes doing a lot of different things in their portfolio. And it, it's really just opening up a whole new world of things to put on seed. I did find a really nice reference on uh, Microbe challenges and opportunities. Uh, if you want to learn more about this and, and just get the t a flavor for how many, you know, this is this is a very brief overview. That there's just an awful lot of really interesting stuff going on, and uh, that, that's a good summary of for starting to get a better understanding of that. So there are an incredible number and uh, very diverse opportunities with microbes. I've, I worked on, I work mostly in uh, seed treatments myself, but I've looked at trying to do things with microbes on seed treatments versus foliar sprays and other applications. It's a great way of, to getting it to the crop and uh, for the same reasons it is for chemistry. It, it's very targeted. It's, it's a relatively consistent environment when you're trying to get them to start multiplying in the soil uh, and, and just ease of use, of course, and all the other things. Uh, conceptually, it's very simple. I could probably go out to the, my backyard, pick up some microbes, isolate some, 
make a rudimentary seed treatment and put it on some seed. If I'm lucky, it even does something agronomically beneficial. So it, that, that looks so simple, but if you look at all the things I just talked about, um, there's a long chain of impact on seed treatments where you, everything from the treating process to the planting to the, to, to the soil once it's in the soil and getting the, those all uh, sorted out takes a lot of work. It sounds tough, but I do say do it. I, I see there's an enormous amount of progress being made um, and, and there's an, an incredible amount of opportunity. You can do it, but you have to invest appropriately. You have to understand and appreciate what all is involved to make these work properly. And um, that's, that's it. Hopefully, uh, Hopefully uh, you'll see in the retail chain uh, good improvements in profit profitability with these things coming to market. Well, thanks so much, John. We'll have one more quick Q&A session before we sign off for the day. If you have a question for John or Russell or Alan, feel free to type it into the chat box now. John, will application equipment have to evolve as microbial-based products do? Well, it'll be a comp competition between uh, formulations and how well they work versus uh, recognition by the genetics company as to what advantage, what benefits they get by reconsidering how they're putting uh, materials on seed. So it can be attacked from both directions, and, and I do believe that um, at some point in time uh, it will evolve to to be more. Um, Treating processes will evolve to be more amenable to microbes just because they'll become a point where you're going to want to put two or three or four on regularly to get all the benefits that you might get out of them. And then they become a primary target, not just a kind of a secondary application. How sensitive can microbes be to regional climate differences and how does that process work? So um, microbes are Microbes are very diverse. The, the, some are, are very sensitive environments. Some are some are more robust. You have to sort out which. You have two choices on the matter. You, you can either sort out what microbe fits in what environments, or you can look for microbes that do well across environments. Um, so that that that's a that's a strategic part of it. it. It's just the fundamental nature of the microbes and you have to decide if you're focusing on a broadly um, survivable microbe, broad performing across microbes, which is generally the preferred approach, or if you're looking at more geographic uh, restrictions on where you're trying to get these microbes implemented. Well, thank you so much, John. That's all the time we have today. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors one more time, 2020 Seed Labs, CCAN, and Cantera for their support. I'd also quickly like to thank our team working behind the scenes for all their hard work in making this happen, Kyle Dradawani and Teresa Kerjewitz. Once again, this webinar will be available on germination.ca very soon. Thanks again, and we hope you all have a terrific day. This is Mark Zinkowitz of Germination signing off. Mm -hmm.